All right, welcome, ladies and gents, to uh, CST 215, section 300. Uh, just so you know, there's five sections of this database course, so there's lots of you. Um, but essentially, I'll go through my introduction of who I am properly, and then we'll uh, I'll discuss what we're covering, stuff like that. Okay. I graduated. I am not. I don't have a college, university degree. I have a college diploma, just like you guys are trying to achieve. I graduated from Canada College in '96. It's been a while. Um, I've been working as a professional developer ever since. I've had a grand total of three weeks of unemployment in the last 21 years. Just so you know. Um, I work full time, and I teach part time. Some of the teachers don't tell you the difference and what that means for you guys. Uh, one, what does it mean that I work full time? It means there's whole blocks of hours during the week I cannot be contacted by students. So I may answer the emails. I may not answer your emails. Do not panic. I'm not ignoring you. I am just trying to make a living. Pay my mortgage. Uh, the fact that I teach part time also means that I arrange my work so it's easy to grade. Doesn't mean it's easy to do, but it means it's easy to grade. It's structured. It's straightforward. It's obvious what you have to do. I currently work for a company called Catlink Technology Corporation. I guarantee out of the last five years I've said that, one person knew who that was. Uh, it's a very niche industry. Uh, we make desktop design software. We compete with Corel and Adobe. And still I'm saying names you guys should know, but you've never heard of us. It's because we make software for sign makers. You know, when you look at the big billboards, there's a 56% chance that was printed using our software. It's just very niche market. Okay, what kind of person am I? I? I have a loose and easy teaching style. I don't have class notes. Those are my class notes. This, the, the slideshows get uploaded. I used to actually walk into class with a with a sticky note with what I needed to talk about that day. Uh, if you do this for if you do database work for long enough for a while, for a while you just need to remember what you need to talk about and that's what you do. Uh, apparently, I've been told I'm sarcastic, and I'm well, my ta my daughter told me to add another word after sarcastic, and that was savage. Yeah, those of you that have experienced me already know what I'm talking about. Um, that also means that I am not politically correct. I work in the industry. Sometimes bad words come out of my mouth. I apologize now. It'll happen. Odds are you will be picked on. Where will you be picked on? Whatever reason I decide to choose that day. Whether you have five names because of where you came from, or you're an enemy freak and you've got to try to beat my watch list, good luck. Um, or whether or not I catch you playing um, insert game here in class, I can guarantee I'll roast you then. Used to be League of Legends, and I could tell that one out from right across the room because of that. Trust me, I hear enough clicking, I know what you're doing. And then I will call you out in class. And then you stop coming to class because you're humiliated. But at least everybody else has a better learning experience. Um, I do understand that life happens. Essentially, that means that sometimes things happen and you can't get your work done on time. And you let me know ahead of time that work won't happen on time. And sometimes I'll forgive past a due date. But by life happens, I'm not talking, oh, my dog got into the fridge, ate a brick of cheese, and puked all over my laptop. That excuse only ever worked once. And no, it really did work once. It was fantastic. They had photos to prove it. So if life happens and it's something like that, pictures, please, then I'll, I might buy it. Yeah, exactly. There's various things. But essentially, if something bad happens, not necessarily require proof, but you know, oh, you were you had the flu for the last week, and obviously nobody at the school saw you. 
good enough. Um, I don't suffer fools. Now, what do I mean by fools? Did you ever hear the expression that there's a difference between dumb and stupid? Dumb is something you're born, stupid is something you choose to be, right? You can substitute this word for stupid. So if you choose to act dumb in my class, great for you. I have no patience for it. You want to banter with me? That's okay. There's certain lines you don't cross, and you'll find out the second I call you out on it, within reason. And as I already warned you, I'm an equal opportunity offender. Um, I do tend to be able to pick out certain types of people in a group. You know, otaku's call to each other. It's life. Game freaks call out to each other. That's life. There's not much I can do about it. Okay, textbook time. Yay! The bookstore fucked up. <laughs> this is the only way to describe We just had a meeting explaining to us. You are to request, and I've been told to tell all my students, you are to request a $200 refund. Because you've been charged for two books that you are not supposed to have. I was told by the person that's in charge of the textbooks for this course. I'm not. But the fellow who's in charge said they basically ordered MDM for you guys, Modern Database Management, another one, which you find online through the bookstore, the online books, you know, the digital resources, and you get it through Tixedium. Those are not the books for this class. Those are the books for this class last year. This is the book you should have. Now, at the bookstore, I've been told it's selling for about 90 bucks right now. Here, if you're one of 14 people that goes to Amazon really fast, you can get it for 53 bucks. Now, how many people are going to jump on Amazon before I've done this statement? Yeah, or Indigo. Or if you know where to go shop, you are, you can get it for free. Not telling you where to go. Um, but this is the book we're going to use, and how you are going to be reading it lots. If we're going to force a textbook onto you, I intend for you guys to use it and use it, and use it. Textbook number two, the one with the shrew on it. Right now, Amazon's got it going for about 20 bucks. Right? Apparently, it's about 40 bucks at the bookstore. Typical school markup. 40 bucks isn't bad, it's a good book. Honestly, I don't think you can eat it. Just putting it out there, don't spend the money on it yet. I'll tell you if you need to go buy the money. Spend the money on it. Uh, they're still negotiating what chapters I'm supposed to get you guys to read out of it. And so far, nobody's come up with a concrete answer. So unless somebody tells me what chapter we're going to use, chapters we're going to use, I say don't buy it. So you can save yourself 15 to 30 bucks. Unless you go shopping in the high seas, then it costs you nothing. Okay, Dan's rules for success. By the way, my name is Dan. <laughs> come to lecture. And about attendance. I don't take attendance as a rule of thumb, especially not the first day, which I think is the best attendance I've ever had in any class is this one. Good job, guys. I think you're all here. Um, however, I'll get, get back to why I don't care about attendance. Two, do your work. That should be a no-brainer. However, you know the way the high school system is nowadays, it just says, oh, you did your work. That's okay. Give me a little project in the end. We'll pass you. Next teacher's problem. Uh, I'll fail you. If you don't do your work, I'll fail you with a smile, because you deserve it. Hand in your work on time. Here's one of the side effects of me working. The way it works is there's a due date. If you're past that due date, wow, I actually have not enough room for everyone. Oh, one chair there, one chair there. I got room for two sitters. If somebody's really brave, they can sit under the dripping water. Uh, and there's one there. So one chair there, one chair there, and one chair there. So there's room for three. Oh, you're too slow. Any other chairs? Anywhere? Anybody? Ah, uh, yeah. Hot damn. Oh, yeah, one, two. Yeah, dude, there's one here up front. Um, if the guys in the third row are willing to get a bit cozy, Going left, if you're willing to shift a bit left, he'll be able to sit right next to the Tim Hortons cup. 
So everybody shuffle left a little bit to give him some room to sit. I don't care if you don't like him. He's going to sit with you. Okay, back to my do your work and hand it on time. If you hand it on time, you have the potential of getting full marks. If you are, I give you guys a one week grace period with a 10% penalty. That's not 10% off the score you got, that's 10% off the potential 100% score. So if the assignment's out of 50, it's five off the top. That's fair. That means that best you can have is an A+. If you're more than a week late, goose egg. Unless you've spoken to me, and I don't mean, you know, send me an email 10 minutes before it's due at midnight. You probably know you're going to be late and that things are going to go wrong. If you're more than two weeks late, it's an automatic zero. You make my life grading so easy. Because right? I sort by not submit and go zero, 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 all the way down. I can grade 10 people in 10 seconds. Life is easy. Okay. That having been said. If you don't hear me assign the work in class, then it's not due. I put in this disclaimer because there once was a time where Blackboard randomly shuffled my due dates. As in assignments were due the year before. Why? I don't know. Uh, as you experience Blackboard more, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Blackboard's good. Blackboard has bad days. Um, labs are due by the start of the next lecture. And that actually is changing a little bit because of the size of the group. Labs are due in one week. I forgot to change the slide. I just hit it as I said it. I forgot to change the slide. Uh, because what's happening is this is a split group for the labs. I've got three, uh, three sections for lab, and Cheryl, which you have not met, has one section for lab. So whoever's in section 301, you've got a lady called Cheryl covering your labs for you. She's quite knowledgeable in database stuff. She kind of makes me feel stupid sometimes. So that, you know. So if you have any database type questions, she's definitely the one to answer your question for you. Um, but that means you have a week to do it. So in other words, if you have one week to do it, just ignore the first sentence. Late labs are an automatic zero. You have 10 labs in 14 weeks. In there, there's two work periods. So the labs actually get staggered out a little bit. The last lab usually is two weeks to do. Such like traffic cop. Um, so that's the rules on that. What can you expect this term? Uh, you're going to get lectures. Duh. You're going to get labs. Same thing. Uh, you're going to get a couple of tests and a two-part exam. Right down here next between the, the ROG guys. Man, there's so many of those matching laptops in here. It's hilarious. And it's like watching all the high school girls with their uh, hand solo boots and their vests going to buy Starbucks. Okay, lectures are free form. I don't use lecture notes. Don't ask for them. I don't have them. Uh, it goes from a bullet list, which is my, my uh, PowerPoints. I've just started using PowerPoints in the last couple of years. Historically, I hate them. Uh, but life works. Uh, labs are gradual in difficulty. And then they peak around week eight or nine. So by the time we reach week nine of this term, you're going to hit the top edge of how hard the labs get. So it, it does this kind of thing. Uh, it's also timed in such a way, I timed my course in such a way that you normally only have stuff due for me. Well, so my stuff never gets due pretty much at the same time as everybody else. So usually right before my stuff is due, you finished working on everybody else's stuff. So I try to time my work so that you guys don't suffer and now suddenly have uh, three assignments and three classes due the same day. Um, assignments are submitted via Blackboard. I know you, I always give you two weeks to do your assignments. They're not brutally hard. So again, no excuses. They're work, but they're not hard. Ish. Uh, tests are online and you have I give you a week to do your tests. You go home and you do your test when you feel like it. Whether you're sitting on the couch with a beer going click, 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 great. If you want to do it in a class somewhere here, that's fine too. I don't care. Um, 
Historically, they took anywhere between half an hour to an hour. So if I give you a test that takes an hour to do and you've got a week to do it, if you forget to do it, Okay, lecture recording. Some of you have noticed a camera. Some of you have noticed I'm wearing a headset. Uh, what you don't know is this ends up in you on YouTube within a day or two. Uh, I've been given permission to upload my content to YouTube because I'm the one creating the content. I'm not going to argue the terminology they used that day. Um, so what happens is I record the lecture. I tend to process it the next day. So then I can bleep out bad words and stuff like that, if I choose to. Um, then I upload it to YouTube and I post an announcement with a link. I record all my lectures except for very specific ones. Uh, I don't record the review at the end of the term. And I don't record the value-added lectures, the ones that where the content doesn't go towards the exam. Okay? Okay. What are you going to be learning this term? You're going to be learning basic database design. You're going to learn about SQL. You're going to learn about views, triggers, and stored procedures, and amongst other things. I make this slide really generic because it allows me some flexibility in what I teach and how I teach it. Um, but the big important ones are that you're going to learn database design, and you're going to learn the terminology that goes with it, and the concepts that go with it. You should have a solid foundation in design. You won't be an expert. But if an expert comes and talks to you, you probably won't look like a rabbit about to be eaten by my cat. Which is, that was last night. Um, the SQL is an industry standard language used to talk to databases. You should come out of here with a fair understanding of that language. Um, you should be able to use it. And uh, yeah, there's not much to say other than that, that you'll be able to use it and you should have enough of a foundation that you should be able to work past your basic. The goal is that you'll know, you'll by the end of this term, you will know what you don't know. Therefore, you'll know how to go Google for answers. I make it sound like I don't spend my days on Google. I do. All right, this is the slide that everybody panics about. How are you evaluated? Labs are 10%. Quizzes, also known as hybrids, are 10%. And to mention the hybrids on the way by, I've changed the format of them a little bit this term. Uh, the first three are watch a video of me sitting in my office at work discussing something and then go answer some questions. Uh, after that, some of them are reading, some of them are go do a tutorial, that kind of stuff. They're 10%. You get Two assignments, each worth 10%. So assignments are worth 20%. Two tests, total 20%. Each of them worth 10%. There is a theory final exam. That's the one where everybody cries. And they're sitting in a room. And I can guarantee you'll probably be in the gym uh, with 300 other people. And then there'll be another 200 in the cafeteria, because there's so many of you this term, there's 475 of you. So there's a lot of exam papers to get printed. Um, that's going to be a Scantron job. Fill in the blanks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the final exam practical. That one is done during your lab period, the last week of class before the exam. It's worth 20% of your grade. I will be going in detail later what's involved with that. However, I've been told it's by far the most fair practical exam administered in CT. It is designed specifically to allow, give you a hope of getting points. And if you're actually half decently competent, you'll get a good grade. And if you're a rock star, you'll get 100%. And I've had rock stars not get 100% because they got too cocky and they made a mistake. OK, this is known as a 323 class. I don't know if you've been explained what these numbers mean. It means that you have three hours of theory, two hours in class, one hour of hybrid, two hours of lab. And theoretically, you should be spending three hours a week studying for this class. The way I try to structure it is, realistically, you can probably get away with one to two hours of studying. But we're supposed to take three for those that require a little extra time. 
Okay, here's the official statement of how to pass the course. This is on your course outline. You have to write the final exam. No show, automatic F. Makes my life easy. You must achieve 50% on your tests and your assignments and your group work. Now, this one, how I apply that 50% is up to me. I don't mean you have to get 50% on every assignment or every piece of group work or every 50% of whatever. I take the total and you got to get 50%. So if you go and shit the bed on the first test and do fantastic on the second one and they add up to 50%, hot damn, you passed. So try to get more than 50%. Um, you must also complete your assignments in your labs. Um, you know, that's negotiable, sort of, but not quite. The assignments must be completed. The labs, often people drop the last one because they just can't cope anymore. Uh, I'm not telling you it's a nice thing to do, but, you know, roughly. Um, I'm going to skip the last slide because someone on the reason I loaded the wrong slideshow and I got last summer's due dates. Uh, the due dates are actually on Blackboard. Um, I'll show them to you when I do the tour of how the course is organized. Now I'm going to go do a two-second tour of Blackboard for this course. Really? All right. Here's your view as a student. Under course information, you'll find the CSI, the course section information. That tells you where the, when the things are due, what you'll be learning every week, what you're supposed to read every week, what labs you're supposed to do, everything. This is where they tell us to handhold you guys so you guys don't know what's not happening. Uh, the course outline is obviously the contract between me and you. The course outline says I teach these things. I will deliver the content to you. That I go through the course outline halfway through the term on my own and go, oh shit, I forgot to do that. And then I make sure I shove it in somewhere else along the way. Uh, course documents is where you are going to find uh, various and sundry documents. Now, there's things in here you can't see yet, but the PowerPoint presentations will be in here. Right now, there's the first four weeks worth of presentations are up. Congratulations. So you now know what you're learning for the next four weeks. Um, later on, you'll need some tutorial. You'll probably want to do some tutorials to help bring up some of your skills and some of the content. Uh, and then there's some other files. Student tools, well, that's the usual crap. Email, library resources, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Assignments. What do you think is under assignments? Yeah. Uh, tests. This is where your tests are going to be. Hybrids are where all your hybrids are. And recordings is once the recordings come up, I post them in there. They will be posted weekly. And as you can see, there are 10 hybrids. And one's not showing up. Go figure. Yay, Blackboard. I nah, just got to move it up. So essentially the way it works with the hybrids is I don't have a set due date for them. If you want to ignore them until the last week and then spend seven or eight hours just cramming your way through them, knock yourself out. Are you going to lose some value as the term goes on? Probably. Those tend to go lockstep. So week one matches pretty much what you're going to learn in week one. Week two matches what you're going to learn in week two. So you, you know when they talk about the one hour of hybrid and three hours of study time? There's your study time. You can piggyback your hybrid and your study time as one thing. Reduce your load a little bit. Um, so that's that. Now, I'm just going to bring this down. <sighs> now it's time to get to the meat and potatoes. That's the introduction. Anybody got any questions for me before I start? I will not ridicule people asking questions. Yes.
Uh, it's the ones that show up in your digital library. I've been told you've been charged $200 for modern database management and some other book. Yes. Uh, I have no idea. Talk to somebody at the library. I really don't know. I've just been told to tell you guys to go get a refund. How is the process? You could ask Todd. He probably knows. Todd Kelly, he's your coordinator. Uh, did you guys elect a class rep yet? No? Not yet? Really? <sighs> There should be a level rep and a class rep. More Normally, every group, every class, every lecture, you'll want to pick someone to interface on behalf of the group with the teacher. So if you guys have, are too shy to complain to me directly, and I don't give a shit if you're shy, just tell me. You can talk to that person, they come and talk to me. So if I manage to, manage to offend someone and they don't want to tell me I offended them, talk to that person, then he'll come and tell me. And then I'll try not to say the same thing a second time. Um, but there should also be a, a, a level rep, so basically a rep that represents, you know, level one students and whoever that ends up being, probably have a chat with Todd and find out how to do the refund. Instead of everybody going to ask him, pick someone to go ask, someone you can trust. And you don't know, and most of you don't know each other, so take a crapshoot who you can trust. <laughs> you know? But it's one of those things. Okay. Any other questions before I continue? Going once, going twice, almost sold. Yes. Uh, you haven't done your lab yet, have you? Lab one. It goes through what you need to download, what you need to install, and in detail, mostly on how to do it to achieve that goal. Uh, when's your lab? So you're going to sit with me and I can help you. Uh, I just finished walking through with Cheryl. Wow, there's no room. They actually overbooked this room. Hot diggity damn. Yeah. There is absolutely no seating space left. I'm going to have to have a chat with someone. Yeah, in two weeks there'll be room. Uh, I guarantee, usually I lose six students within the first three weeks that decide this was not for them. So, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Have a seat on the stairs. I don't know. If you're going to sit there, careful, the ceiling is dripping. That's why there's an empty spot there. There are no chairs. And there's, yeah, because the ceiling is dripping. That's why there's no one there. Okay, well, I'm going to keep going because there's nothing else I can do for that. Uh, but yes, there is software you're going to be using for this course. Okay. <sighs> Lecture one. Lecture one is an info dump, just so you know. Oh, yes, I guess I should discuss this a little bit for a second. I teach my database course back password from everybody else. Don't know why, but apparently I do it backwards. But it seems to work for my students, so I'm okay with that. Um, the other ones, they'll teach some SQL first and then teach design. I teach all the design stuff first and then teach SQL. I figure you should understand what you're playing with before you play with it. That's my, that's my concept. You should understand what the structures are before you play with it. It's a bit like letting a monkey fix your engine. The monkey can might fix your engine, but you might also wreck your engine. Yes. Oh no, you just don't read the instruction, plug it in. Holy crap. <laughs> okay. So this slideshow matches out some of the stuff in the textbook. And I gotta double check what you're supposed to read this week, but if you check the CSI, I guarantee there's gonna be a big reading assignment. Uh, why? Because I need you guys to get through a certain chunk of content in the book. Uh, the good news is the book that went from Jan Harrington is written in plain English. It makes sense. It's easy to read. Unlike the one last year, which was like gibberish. Um, it was a horrifyingly terrible book. 
which also costs two hundred dollars. This one, depending where you go shopping, is anywhere from fifty to ninety. That's half the price. Okay, so there's data and information. So we're going to start talking about what we're really dealing with here. There's two things in the world: one called data, one is called information. Data is unprocessed information, such as a customer course and employee. It's you guys are students. Right now, as far as I'm concerned, you're unprocessed data. You're raw information. Um, there are the building blocks of the information. So when you start talking about information, on the other hand, it's produced by processing the data that is related. So anybody here ever do surveys, not answering surveys, but actually run a survey? One, two, three, four, okay, four. Um, or anybody here ever watch the guy sitting inside of the road counting cars going by? You know, they're sitting under their umbrella and they're going click, click, click every time a car goes by. They're actually counting brands of cars, by the way. If you're curious what they're doing. That's a Volvo, that's a Volvo, that's a piece of shit right, sir. That's a Volvo, that's a Volvo. <laughs> oh, and that one's a Natasha. That counts for three. Um, what they're doing is they're collecting data. It's unprocessed. It means nothing. It's just raw data. So what you end up doing is to gather information, you take the data and you do something with it. And then you transform the raw data into information, just like a survey. You run a survey with 100 questions. People answer those 100 questions. You get back data. Do you know what this data means? No. Until you take the results, you collate the results, you add them up, you count how many people answered yes, how many people answered no. You know, do you like hot wings, yes or no? Then you can determine the percentage of people that like hot wings. And that becomes information. But for that, it was data. When you're making decisions, you need information and you need it timely. So you run a survey and you decide to order 150 pounds of wings. Then you discover half the class is vegan and they eat trees, nuts, and roots. Not being, sorry if there's a vegan in the class, I'm making fun of you, but that's okay because you can make, I'll make fun of meat eaters next. But you suddenly discovered all you needed was 50 pounds of wings because that's all you needed. If you had accurate and timely information before you made that decision, you wouldn't have ordered so many wings. And then you all end up looking like me. Um, so good decision making is key for an organization's survival. Anybody ever hear of companies that make a bad decision because they thought they knew what was happening all the time? You hear about companies that are, oh, what a great idea, and they're bankrupt. Yep. No, it's a great machine that got killed. It's not the same thing. Well, yeah, it's Sega. What do you expect from a hedgehog? Um, but the good decision making is key to an organization's survival. If you don't have good decision making, companies don't survive, and they get bought up by someone else. Anybody? I can use an example. Somebody at Nortel made some really bad decisions. Anybody know where Nortel is nowadays? It's a series of lawsuits, people fighting over IP. And they still have an office in Ottawa, and it has 22 employees in it. And they're all lawyers in one account. No, really. That's all that's left of a company that had like over 7,500 employees in Ottawa. Because somebody made some bad decisions and cooked their books because their decision-making process wasn't very good because they were reaching ahead before they had concrete information. They were working on raw data, going, man, look at this. People bought a big pile of our hand phone handsets. They must really want good handsets. No, they wanted cheap handsets. Though yours just happened to be cheaper than Mitel's. Which ones were better? Mitel's. They wanted the cheap ones, but people thought they wanted pants, so they made them pants and expensive, and people stopped buying them. So then they had to cook the books to make the investors happy. So that's the difference in data and information. Data is raw and stuff that hasn't been processed yet. Information is stuff you can make decisions with. 
The point of a database is to take raw information, store it in a structured manner that allows you to make good decisions. That's the goal. Okay, way back. We're going way back here. When computers first started coming out, and I'm talking computers that were the size of this room. Actually, this room's really big, but I've seen big computers. Most information processing was actually used using databases that were actually file systems. So the file system was also the database. They, uh, they was, did both two in one. It was kind of weird and kind of cool. Um, when I was in college, they tried to teach, make me learn that, and I got a support from someone else to take something else. Um, looking back, it might have been a stupid decision. Um, but there used to be a system called AS400 from IBM. Anybody here ever hear that phrase? Yay, one! You didn't aid yourself at all because they're still in use. <laughs> Where do you work? That I should have known it was a government thing. <laughs> the AS400s are great. They don't die. These machines will go on forever. Uh, they use a language called RPG400. And the database is the file system. You can actually go CD from one database object to another and actually change directories as if you're in a command prompt. It's really cool. It's really weird. Um, so the result of that is as computers modernized a little bit and they weren't running on these old beasts, they kept this mentality of using files. So you had a file for everything. Basically a, disk, a piece of it from a blob of text on a disk. That was sort of structured. And some of the file systems would be an order. So a customer orders a product from a retailer. And you could either have a file that listed all the orders or you could have one file per order. It was a big disorganized mess. Um, so a customer orders a product from a retailer. The sales department takes the order from the customer, the sales department sends a request to shipping, and literally they're moving files around on a computer. And you know they look at their files and say, oh, look at this, I got something new to work with. Um, now, expanding that, they create an order. Now, anybody here ever used the old pen and paper orders? Ever work in a place where they still took orders on a piece of paper? Anybody? Age? No, not feel old. Um, but you used to see that all the time where you'd see a piece of paper which was an order form. Okay, how many of you sold crap through school? You know, let's buy cookie dough. Yeah, citrus orders. Yay, support band. Uh, so the track team doesn't get the money. Um, that kind of stuff. It's literally what they were doing is they'd have files on the computer and they'd fill in all this information. And the shipping department would enter this special document and put it on the computer. The computer would file this document somewhere. And then the shipping department would get this file. They'd print it out. And then they'd go grab the stuff on the shelf, shove it in the box, and hope UPS delivers it. Or nowadays, it'd be Intelcom. Hope delivers it. So that's what file systems were like. It was pretty horrifying. Now, when you're dealing with file systems, some of the possible files you would hit is you'd have a file for the sales department. So the sales department would have a customer file, a product file, a sales file. The shipping department would have a customer file and a shipping document. Now, as the next question comes in, can anybody think of what is the problem with this kind of an organization? Pretend you're working inside your own little bubble. Yes. For the same thing. So an order would come in, it would get entered the customer file, typeity, typeity, typeity. And then the guy would look up at the screen, write it out on a piece of paper, or enter a new file, a new document, and save it to the computer, depending where you're working. And the shipping dog guy would open it up and type it into his customer database. It was redundant. It was slow. It was terrible. And there's still companies doing it that way today. Why? Because they're using AS400s. <laughs> Not quite. Actually, using same, same things that are a little older than that. 
like an old System 36 or you know uh, PDP 10, the really old computers. So one of the problems we have with this is you have customer in two different places, which means where would you go to look up the phone number for a customer? You're going shipping. You look at your customer file. Oh, this customer's not in here. Where's the phone number? Picks his ass up, walks down the hall, goes into the sales department, go, I'm looking for this customer. What's his phone number? Oh, it's this. I put it on the order form. It says I can't read your handwriting. Okay. So what would happen is you couldn't find information ever anywhere. It was just terrible. Which leads us to data redundancy. The same data appears in more than one location. Which means you're doubling up the amount of space you're using. Nowadays with our you know terabyte drives, 500 gigabyte drives, even 120, 120 gig drive, who cares if you're storing an extra 10k, 50k? Let's hark back to when I was in school. Okay? I started working for a company called Bort Longyear for my co-op. They're a division of De Beers International. Their accounting system ran on a computer where the hard drive is the size of this table. Because it was old. How much storage space do you think they had in this table? 32 megabytes. Okay? Think about that. By today's standards, that's seven pictures. They ran, the, uh, they ran a multi-billion dollar company on the equivalent of seven pictures. And it occupied an area this big. So, do you think they cared about duplicating data? Having the customer information in more than one place? The same information multiple times? Hot damn they cared. They had, might have to go spend another 25 grand for another 32 megs of storage space. Which brought us to another problem. Not just the cost of it. Data inconsistency. Remember the example I just did about the fellow that goes to shipping and then he doesn't have a phone number? So he has to go to accounting or to sales and then suddenly they're sitting there going, hey, the data is inconsistent. No shit. Well, maybe you should enter the data in here, but now we're entering the data twice. And then two weeks later, the customer changes their phone number. Now they got two different phone numbers. Which one's the right phone number? Nobody knows. Let's call them both. And if anybody here remembers the 90s, you probably remember 25 cents a minute phone calls when you called out of your house to someone, you know, down the road because you were in a different town. Data anomalies is the end of the result. You end up having stuff that's not quite right. So when changes to redundant data are not made successfully, for example, the customer now has two different phone numbers. That means you have a data anomaly. A data anomaly means your data is wrong. And something has gone wrong and nobody knows what. It's like watching X-Files. What's the mystery today? Surprise, it's aliens. Because it always aliens after the first season. But the redundant data ends up causing anomalies because it doesn't get updated all the time. Which leads me to talk about data anomalies. The first one is what they call a modification anomaly. As you can see, this is all terminology today. And a modification anomaly means your, the, when the data gets updated in the database, in the server, that it gets updated successfully everywhere. If it doesn't get updated successfully everywhere, what happens? You have an anomaly. Which means now people can't make proper decisions because your information is no longer valid. Now, that's bad. And it's, a lot of it was caused because computers used to be really slow. Did you ever watch an older movie where they're still using the tape to tape drives? Anybody here actually have, have God, I'm going to age myself. Anybody here have a Commodore 64? Did you have the tape drive or the diskette? Oh, you're way modern. Those of us that had the tape drive, kick, play. Um, and once in a while, when you were saving your files, the tape would get eaten, and then you had a data anomaly, also known as eaten tape. 
because the tape died. Now picture, it's a corporation using the big tape to tape reels where it, the tape is moving constantly back and forth through a machine writing and reading data. And suddenly it's writing one customer record, it goes to move to another table and update the same customer record and the power goes out and the tape dies. By today's standards, that probably won't happen because computers are fast. But this also leads you to say, well, what happens if the programmer sucks? We have stairs. <laughs> That's the only seat I now have to offer. That's the biggest group I've ever had to actually show up. That's amazing. Um, so that was a modification anomaly. It was ter those are terrible because whether it's caused by bad hardware, caused by bad programming, data anomalies are bad. Modifications are that. Insertion anomalies. An insertion anomaly means when you're putting something into one of the files and it ends up going in an in inconsistent state. You write something in a file, then you write something in another file, and the power goes out. Guess what? It never made it to the second file. Therefore, the shipping guy no longer knows what the guy's phone number is. Why? Because it never got put into his file. Deletion anomalies. We need to delete some data back to the power outage. We're deleting from file one, it succeeded, and go to delete from file two, and the power goes out while it's doing it. Guess what? We have a deletion anomaly. We have data in one place and not in the other. They should both be there, but they're not. They should both be gone, but they're not both gone. Okay. Now, to talk about a modification anomaly, I'm actually going to go forward a little bit here. Modification anomaly, in this case, employee number 519 has two different addresses because somewhere along the way something went wrong. This is a modification anomaly. Right now, can you tell what their, their valid address is? Can you? No? I can't. There's no way to know. It's magic. Um, then depending on the database server you were working with originally, you get one address one day and you get the other address the other day. They could come out randomly, depending on how they decide to pull the data out. And he's got two different skills, two different addresses. That's what's called an update anomaly. Now it gets worse. What happens if we have another table somewhere else with that guy's address in it? How do we know which one's the right record? We don't. So those are anomalies. The goal of good database design is to not have this happen to you. Now I'm going to use another example, a deletion anomaly. <coughs> now, right now, if you look at this table, we have a teacher teaching this course. Somebody goes along and says, hey, Dr. Gid, whatever the heck this guy's name, Giddens, is not teaching ENG 206 this year. Therefore, he shouldn't be in the database attached to ENG 206. So let's go and delete NG 206. When you delete data in a database, the whole row goes with it. If I delete ENG 206, what happens? Dr. Giddens goes with it. We no longer know that we even hired Dr. Giddens. It's gone. Missing in action. That's called a deletion anomaly. Um, anybody here ever delete files on your hard drive and suddenly discover you deleted way more than you're planning to? Yes, we've all done that. That's known as a deletion of fuck up. A deletion anomaly, you can just go with the same thing, is you need to delete one piece of information, but because the database is badly structured, you end up deleting stuff you're not supposed to delete. So that's a deletion anomaly. Yet another goal. Yet another goal of proper database design. Now, the as the example here, we could lose the hiring date 
if we remove the row, in actual fact, we could lose the entire faculty if we're not careful. Um, and or alternatively, if we go and fire uh, Dr. Saperstein here, we could discover that we no longer know about CMP 101 and CMP 102. Why? Because we fired a piece of uh, a member of faculty, and because the only way we know these courses exist because it's attached to him. Hot damn, we can't offer essential computers anymore. They go, well, that's great. We can cut the budget. So we turn around and we have an insertion anomaly. We just hired a new prof, Dr. Newsom. And the problem is Dr. Newsom is not teaching anything yet. Therefore, if he's not teaching anything yet, he or she, I shouldn't assume their gender, he or she, we don't know what they're teaching. Therefore, guess what? We can't put them in the database because we don't have a course. They just got hired, but we don't know what they're going to be teaching yet. Therefore, we can't even put them in the database the way it is now. That's known as an insertion anomaly. If you don't have a course, you can't teach. If you don't have a course, you can't be hired. Okay. Um, so that being said, we can't record this person because of the structure of this database. Um, week three, I'll be teaching you how to resolve this particular problem properly. Next week is another terminology class. Um, but this is known as an insertion anomaly. We are unable to add someone to the database because we don't have all the information we need. And thus, this information is floating around somewhere on a piece of paper on someone's desk until a course gets assigned to them. Then we can put them in the database. Does that sound like an ideal situation? Not really. So we want to avoid that. All right, back to file systems. Now. Programs used to be written to access data. In other words, you'd retrieve information from a customer. A program was written to do that and only that. AS400. If you ever worked with one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have a form. This form reads cut information. That's all it can do. It was written to deal with that one piece of information and only that one piece of information. Then you hit this weird shift function F14 to jump to the next form. Why? Because that's how it worked. Um, ditto for COBOL. It was the same. Um, a program would target a specific file or a set of files depending on what it was doing. So therefore, we could have a customer management program. This customer management program would open the files from sales and the files from shipping and magically make sure everything stays in sync. That's how things were written. And if you needed some new information to be stored, what would you do? Everyone take a guess what you do if you need to record new information? Hot damn. You must have downloaded the slides. Yes, that's what you used to do. Um, there's what, five Mac users. There's this database program on Mac called FileMaker. Probably you've never heard of it. It's a flaming piece of crap. But it's made to be easy to use, just like a Mac. See previous statement. I don't like Macs. I'm sorry, guys. It's great machines. I have the great hardware, but I don't like the design philosophy. But that being said, when you designed a form in FileMaker, it actually created a database tables behind the scenes. So if you had a customer form, it would create customer fields. You created an order, it would create an order for a table. You need to create a new kind of order, it would create a new order table that wasn't related to the first one. And that's how things were written. It was terrible. So then what happened is the programmer had to specify exactly how the processing of data needed to be done. That meant that the programmer would write a little program, and they write another little program, and if something went wrong to the data, it was always the programmer's fault. 
because he didn't understand the business needs. Actually, it's still like that today. But at least the database is outside of the programmer's hands. They just have to make the UI work. So with the old file systems, what would happen if you wanted information from a file quickly? In other words, you need to get all of the customers that are on the East Coast that bought widget five in the last three weeks. What would happen then with the old system, the way it was done, and I mean this was done until you know early 90s commonly, you couldn't get this data out of there. Why couldn't you get the data out of there? Because the programs were written to extract very specific information out of the files. Therefore, if you needed that particular report, you'd send a request to the development department. The guy would sit there and actually write a new little program so you could extract East Coast customers that bought Widget 5 in the last three weeks. If he was really nice, he'd let you type in a date. And that's making a lot of assumptions. So the problem is the program specified the exact structure. Think about how complex the data could get if you're dealing with uh, huge applications that have hundreds of files that break down how the data is contained. Anybody here have an accounting background? Okay. No? Holy crap, what a bland group. Um, I'm just picking on everyone equally right now. But if you have an accounting background, you know that there's all these different pieces of information to deal with accounting, right? There's customers, there's vendors, there's accounts receivable, accounts payable, orders, invoice, the general ledger. And these would all be separate files and usually more than one file. And then if you needed to access information from all these files, you had to write special programs that crawl through all the files, collate the data, and give you information. This information was also known as a report. That's why there used to be all these jobs for report writing. We actually have people all day, all day said there's little programs to extract data. Nowadays, you can do it in 10 minutes. So, which leads me to the next problem. What happens if you want to change the structure of the file? That means you want to add a new field to the a customer file. I don't know. The big game changer that happened in the late 80s, early 90s, closer to the 2000s. Let's give everybody an email address. You didn't even have mobile phone numbers on people's accounts back then, you know. So email address. You'd have to modify every file for a customer that had an email address. Then you had to modify every single program so that they never knew about the email address. If you forgot to change one of the programs, what would happen? You'd have incomplete data because the program doesn't know it's there. And possibly you could damage the file because the guy loads up a record that has an email address reads the record, the guy makes a change and saves it, and the email address disappears. Why? Because the program didn't know it was there. Which brings me to databases. There we go. The history lesson is done, for the most part. But it's important to know where we were so you know where we're going. So that you understand why, when I talk about anomalies, and I talk about things such as normalization, why this stuff is important, and why it used to be the way it is and why it's so much better now. And by I'm saying so much better now, and I'm being very generally facetious about it. It is better. It's just a whole new industry. By new industry, I mean it's been around for 30 years. Um, so it brings us to databases. A database is a structure that contains logically related data into a single repository. Now, Here's a bit of terminology we've got to be careful with. A single repository means all the information is contained in one place. Those of you that have done Lab 1 created a database called ThinkCube and restored a ThinkCube database. That database is a single repository. That one database contains all the information as I designed it within itself. 
So that's a single repository. The data is in there in a structured manner. The data doesn't mean anything, it's just data. If I want to use an example of data, I'll use one where I never remember your names. I will remember almost no one's names a very, with a very select few. Why? Because I suck at remembering names and I see, I've, since I've started teaching, I've gone through 10,000 names. Brain's getting old. If I was a database, it'd all be there. I can just look it up. Um, so a database is a container that holds information. If I want to go to a real world analogy, remember those big old metal filing cabinets full of drawers? And you'd rip it open, and there'd be all these file folders. And depending on where you were, you know, the top folder could be students, the second one could be teacher, the third one would be suspensions, and the third one would be expulsions. Right? So as you go down, things get worse. And that was a single repository that contained information about the student, the teachers, and everything that's gone horribly wrong. All in one place. Single repo. A database server is similar. It's a single repository that contains all the individual pieces of data, and you query that data to turn it into information. So, a database must contain two things. There's the end user component, which is also known as the data. If I look at you guys in here, you're walking sources squirming full of data. You have names, dates of birth, uh, genders, uh, height, skin color, hair color, what are you wearing, what's your SIN number, what's your email address, what's your phone number, what's your student number. This is all data and all of you guys share those data points. It's hopefully you don't all have the same data because somebody's really screwed up at that point. But you should all share a similar data points. So that's the end user component, the data. It comes from an end user, it comes from some external source. <coughs> it also contains something called metadata. That's the data about the data. <laughs> yeah, that's the difference between a database and the file system. The file system contains the data and nothing about the structure. A database contains data about the data. Now, to give you guys a quick example of what I mean by that, I just rattled off a whole bunch of descriptions of people, right? Date of birth, your name, your gender, your height, you're staying away from weight, um, miscellaneous other pieces of information, you know, your address, your phone number, your SIN number, your student number. Now, those are pieces of data. In the database server, there's a definition that says, a student is made out of these pieces of information. So that data describes the actual data. So there's a, a little structure that tells the database server, this is what's in this bin. It's a bit like when you do your school application, you give you a form, right? And you fill in the blanks. Well, nowadays I'm guessing it's probably done online. But back in the day, I know when I did it, we got this big piece of paper then you put in your name and your SIN number and all that jazz, and it was a set format. That form was basically metadata. It, it told you what pieces of information went where and what kind of data went in each of the slots. That's what metadata is. We will spend an awful lot of time in this course learning about metadata, as in what makes up data? How do you structure your content? In your database so that the data makes sense, so that the data is usable, so that the data is functional, so you can turn it into information. If I were to use a quick example of the difference of metadata versus not metadata, I love my whiteboard they gave me for this room. It's on wheels. 
I can actually turn it around and turn it around again. That way I don't have to write kind of funny. Data. It's raw data. Can you tell me what each of those things are at a glance? No. But looking at each piece of information going sideways, what can you guess what these things are? Yes. Are you sure? Are you sure about that? Nice. I wish. Anybody else want to take a guess? Okay, sure, but so far you have to guess, right? You don't know. Let me put some metadata on for you guys. This is great, I can actually turn it around and hide it. Yes, you try really hard, don't you? Well, yeah, I've seen somebody's last name was teacher. I've seen somebody's last name was cobbler. I've never seen anybody whose last name was student, but hell, why not? It used to be your last name was your occupation. Right? Especially if you're English, okay, if you're for English descent, usually most people's last names were literally their occupation. Well, actually, the French still apply the same, you know, Ferrier. Who was that? That's the guy who made horseshoes. So, before this was disorganized data, we really didn't know what was in it. We threw in some metadata. Suddenly, magic. We know what this data is. That's really funny. It doesn't take much to entertain me, does it? Okay. So then we got to talk about the different kinds of databases. First, we have centralized databases. So a centralized database now we're actually, I gotta step back for a second. When we deal with database servers and database systems, there's a variety of different ways they're organized. And this is what the next couple of slides are about. The first one is a centralized database. It supports one or more users at a time. If the database is in one physical location, theoretically, the database could be on a PC, on a mid range machine, which used to be called a micro. Or, it would also, you could also find them on a mainframe. Big iron. Um, basically put, it was a serve piece of software that ran. Multiple people could access it. Everybody touched the same day at the same time. AS400 is an example of one of these. Then somebody came along and said, you know what we need? We need a distributed database. And data is distributed at several physical locations. And the, the database at each physical location can vary. In other words, the content might be different. Or on one place, they might be running it on a, on a mainframe. Another one, they could be running it on a PC. One office has 1,000 employees. The other guy's like six guys that's sitting in the back of a maintenance shack. But they still need to run the same database, but they have slightly different data. Not so common anymore. But you know who pioneered the concept of the, the separated database running in multiple places, at least here in Canada? Anyone want to take a guess? I can guarantee you interact with one of these companies pretty much on a weekly basis. No, no one, no takers yet? How many of you, how many of you use bank card to buy something this week? So who pioneered distributed databases? The banks. Do you remember, oh crap, you guys are all too young. There's probably maybe five people in this room that are old enough to remember this. There once was a time 
where you went to a branch and you deposited a check. And you could run down the street and show them your passbook and withdraw money. And then the check bounces at the other branch. Because it's in one branch's database that you took out money. The, the other branches, oh, it doesn't show. Like your passbook shows it's up to date because it used to take up to two weeks for a check to clear. Oh, I, it looks like we didn't get the nightly update. Hang on, let me take money out of your account. And they had your little pile of money. And then you committed bank fraud. Because the check bounced on the other side. These were distributed databases. Each of the banks ran databases side by side. They kept all their local transactions once a night or way back in the dark ages, once a week, would upload all the changes to a central place which would then redistribute it to all the other banks. Those were distributed databases. Very much not how things are done now, as you can experience, right? You go and, and spend some money at Starbucks, and you go to Starbucks a second time, and a third time, because you know you need that pumpkin spice crap. And then you go buy groceries, you realize you spent 35 bucks at Starbucks today and you have no money. Is it in the same database? Probably not. But it's all centralized. No, that's a distributed file system. It doesn't have a database. Git does not have a database behind it. They have database to maintain their users. We use a Git repo at work, and it's literally a file system. There, are, there is no database attached to Git. Not even close. Um, a database, what you're used to thinking of, you'd be closer to using like Amazon, where they have billions of rows of data. Uh, Git subversion, even CVS, all the same. They have meta files in each of the folders and basically they negotiate amongst the server and the client negotiate amongst each other about what's supposed to be what, which is where you end up with conflicts. <laughs> no, the, what I'm referring to as a database is, well, hang on. I got a picture. Now, what would happen before is you had the files and everybody had to touch the different files. And as you can see right here, this is the old file system where certain people saw certain things, other people saw other things. What nowadays happens is a central repo where everything's self-contained and everybody goes through the database management system to access the data. Now, this is where we have to be careful when we talk about a database. There's a database, and then there's a database server, also known as a database management system, a DBMS. The database is a structure that contains data. The database management system is what allows you to retrieve the data out of the database. Does that make a little more sense? A little clearer? Um, it's good. I love it when the students segue into the next slide. Um, so what happens is there's a layer sitting between the end users and the data, and usually there is an application that talks to the database management system, which then talks to the, the actual database. The database retrieves the data out of it, passes it off to the application, and then the customers, they look at their credit rating, um, that kind of stuff. So that's what a modern database system looks like. Everybody coming in one place, and it's managed through one place. Before, you had different files, different programs that all access similar type data. And depending on where you were, you couldn't see certain things. It was terrible. It was hard to work with. So there's a few other kinds of databases. There's you know the central concept of a database. And after I'm done with the slideshow, I'll be depending if I don't I don't remember if I covered the slideshow off the top of my head. Um, I'll discuss you know some more tangible examples. So you have what they call a production or transactional database or transaction database. Those are databases that support day-to-day -day operations. So what does day-to-day -day operations mean? Anybody? Okay. Sure. But for example, how many of you bought something to eat in the last 
two weeks. Okay, hopefully most of us, right? Unless you live at home with mom and she went to buy you something to eat. Or dad, depending on your case maybe. Do you have a question or are you just saying, I bought food? Because food is good, <laughs> right? Food is fuel. Now, you went to Rotten Ronnie's and bought yourself a McDouble and you paid. And you get this receipt that comes out. That went into their local store database, which then gets uploaded to headquarters later. This, there's another example of a distributed database. Now, that's a day-to-day -day operation, as in you did a transaction, it went into their server, it's accumulating data. The store manager at the end of the day can run a report and see how many McDoubles they sold that day. Hot damn, we got real information. That's day-to-day -day operations. And then there's another kind called decision support. These are databases that have been tuned to provide decision making. So for example, at the end of the day, McDonald's uploads how many of each thing they've sold that day. Each location uploads it to, to the regional headquarters and the regional headquarters uploads it to, you know, uh, McDonald's Borg Central, somewhere in the States. And what they do is instead of uploading that, you know, Dan bought a McDouble with extra pickles at two o'clock, they'll upload, we sold 155 McDoubles today. So they upload summary, summaries of the data into a decision-making process so they can see which products aren't selling, which products are selling. They can make decisions. So that's a decision support database. It's one that takes the data out of the day-to-day -day transactions, summarizes it, and stores it in a summarized fashion. For example, can you imagine being a sales manager for Amazon and say, I want to know right now what sold the best today. What are the odds you'd be able to run that report instantly? Probably run for about six hours, and by then they might as well get the summary data. So for the decision making, they will summarize all the data and upload. And they base their reports on this decision support database. So that's the two difference between those two kinds of databases. Um, does anybody know who the king of the decision support database? Which company, which North American company currently is the king of the decision support database management? Anyone want to take a guess? No, they're not the best at it yet. No, stop thinking high tech. I can guarantee at least half of you have been in one of their stores this week. Not, not Best Buy. Walmart. Currently, Walmart is the leader in North America for the best decision-making support. Um, their systems are so well-tuned and running so well that they suddenly realize that Kansas Chef Boyardee are not selling very well and they will drop the price partly through the day. Um, you don't see it as much as it used to be because they've now got new rules, not Walmart, but that you're not allowed to start fluctuating the prices too much through a day for given products, especially for food. But there once was a time where you could walk into Walmart at 9 o'clock in the morning and see something for $3.99, come back at 2 to be a buck ninety-nine. Uh, don't see that as much in Canada, but in the States, it's constant. Or you go to one Walmart, for example, you go to Watertown, buy some shoes, you're on the way back, you said you're going to cross the border in Oxenburg, stop at the Walmart there, and your shoes are four bucks cheap, and you go, God damn it. And they won't give you a refund because you already bought it the other place at the price you agreed to. Well, often they'll give you the refund anyways, but you know, it's iffy. Um, but Walmart currently is known for being the best decision for making. Their systems are so well integrated that they actually do real time decision making. And then there's the last kind the data warehouse. That's historical data. That's where you summarize data, store it at the back, so that five years from now you can go and see how many McDoubles did we sell in September of 2017. You can go to the data warehouse, it'll give you a summary of how many McDoubles you sold. And they go, holy crap, the week of uh, September 5th, we sold an awful lot of McDoubles at the uh, 
baseline in Navajo branch. Why? Because all the college students are going, I got to buy a laptop, I got to buy food. Now I'm going to cheap on a laptop and buy three McDonald's. I don't need the extra eight gigs of RAM today. Um, but that's what data warehousing is. You take all the old data, you move it out of the day-to-day -day processing, and you store it in the back so you can run reports on the old data. That maybe there's data you don't think is important today, but in five, ten years from now, they might say, really, we should look at what the trends were back then. Maybe it'll reflect to something today. And so to keep the databases small and lean on a yearly basis, they'll trim the fat out of it, move it to the warehouse so that the current one runs nice and smooth, and it gets archived. It's a bit like when you do your taxes. You know, you're not supposed to keep all your papers for five years, right? And what do you do after five years? Well, fine. Other than throw it in the fireplace, you get rid of it. However, you archive five, you keep up rolling five years worth of tax papers to make sure you don't get audited. And that's the law. You know, so five years of information rolling. Your data warehousing your information in case Canada Revenue decides to come pay you a visit and say, by the way, you didn't spend enough money. Or you didn't give me enough taxes, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, if you're lucky. Rarely does it go that way. Yep. So advantage of database processing. Um, you have the ability to get more information from the same amount of data. For example, if all the customer information is in one place, you can retrieve all the related information. So the old system where you had the customer in one place and the accounts receivable in another and the shipping information in another, you'd have to run three different programs and pay some poor intern, assuming they're paid, to actually collate the data to give you information and then there's human error involved. When it's all in one giant repository, you can run a query, which I'll teach you guys how to do later in the term. Then you just go select, you know, whatever from customers, join orders, join accounts receivable, and poof, you have all the information you need with one command. That's one of the big advantages of database processing. Data can be shared. Customer information, for example. The customer information could be in shipping. It could be in accounts receivable. It could be in sales. The good news is, if the sales rep puts in a new phone number for the customer, the accounts receivable now know who to call though who will get the bad money that the guy owes, and the shipping guy also knows what number to call to find out if they've actually paid their bills. So a centralized piece of information means everybody sees the information together as a group. And one of the other big advantages, it um, reduces redundancy. If you have one table that has customer information and it's only in one place, that means if you update that customer, do you have to worry about anomalies propagating through the system? No, because it's being done in one place. Can you imagine if you went to the dentist and you needed to get three fillings. However, dentist A can only work on molars on the top left. Dentist B can work on molars on the bottom left. And dentist C takes care of the front ones. And every time you're done, you have to go change rooms to go talk to the other dentist. That's how it used to be. Nowadays, it's like how you go to the dentist. Man, they'll open you up and go, <laughs> it's like an auto shop. Ten minutes, you got new teeth. Database servers allow you to do that because it's all in one place. Now, it also allows you to balance your data, which was a big problem before. Customer information might have been in shipping and in sales, but account, accounting might not have had the customer information. They just had the raw bits and pieces of numbers rolling through the system. Um, therefore, if databases are structured in such a way that all the users of an organization can access the data, instead of just one group, that means theoretically decision making can be done at a higher level without having to go and ask the peons for the, their reports for the day. Um, Balancing is a good thing. It means that you can include 
job redundancy. Now, how many of you have a job? Okay. Now, how many of you do more than one job at your job? Right? For example, one day you're a cashier. The other day you're walking behind the cash as the clipboard asking, what do your numbers look like? Right, Steph? What are the numbers like? But that's an example, right? Each person has a different job. But sometimes you have more than one job, which means in the, with a centralized database, for some unknown reason, when the shipping guy is off sick, maybe somebody in sales can step in for him and not have to relearn everything. He can just pull up the information he always did, put the crap in the box, and put a sticker in the box, and call UPS and hope it gets sent. Expanding security. Now, when you each had a different application for each job, security was a nightmare. For example, somebody works in shipping and they go missing. You have a guy working in sales. Now he needs to go do something in shipping. Guess what we did have to do? You had two choices back in the old days. And the old computer systems that ran COBOL and PROGRESS and the AS400s of the world. I'm just going to pick on that one all day today. What would happen is you had two choices. You had to create a new user for the person, which would then be given access to the new application. Or what happened absolutely everywhere, you gave the guy the other person's password. Oh, you're working shipping today. Have the shipping password. Congratulations. Now, half the company knows how to get into accounts receivable because you know, that one day they needed to print off invoices for everyone. And now everybody knows how to find out how much everybody owes. That's not ideal. So what happens now when it's a centralized database, you can give users permissions to only specific parts of the database. And if you give them a role and they say, oh, sales, sales can see shipping and customers and orders, but they can't see the accounts receivable. The accountant, on the other hand, can see accounts receivable and customers, but not shipping. Based on the permission systems, you can just give each person the appropriate rights based on what they're allowed to do. You can also get down a little more granular, saying the receptionist, she only gets a read-only view of the customer information, so she can double-check who it is that's calling. But she's not allowed to you know, place an order for them because... That might sound mean to say that, but she might not be qualified to actually take an order. And for this, I'll give a real world example of where I work. I teach by anecdote. So years ago, where I'm working now, I've been there for 17 years. About three years after I started working there, we'd rolled out a brand new shipping system. And some fellow had suddenly discovered a hole in the system. And what he had discovered was that if he went into the database, modified a product record for a customer, he can then walk to shipping and say, ship this guy a new disk and a new dongle. Now, that sounds okay because the guy's in tech support, maybe the guy's CD is broken, the guy needs a new disk, right? No, what he was doing is telling the customer, okay, send a check to me for 250 bucks and I'll send you an upgrade to the latest package, which will cost you a thousand bucks. He got caught after a while, but he found a way around the system because the security was kind of shitty. And he was allowed to update records that he really should not have been allowed to update because it was badly designed. And the old file system would have been, oh, he's got the shipping username because he worked in shipping today. But that would have been even better because we could have never have told at all who it is that placed these orders. And how did he get busted? One of the customers sent the check to our office and said to a PO box. And the guy's name was Kevin. Why is there a check to Kevin on this from one of our customers? Guess where he was working the next day. Okay, so some more advantages of database processing. Increased productivity. We can write queries on the fly. Often I'll get this marketing guy coming in and say, how many copies of SignLab 10 with the Pantone color module turned on that we sell last month? 
so we can determine if we should be doing a promotion. You know, the old system would have been probably a day's worth of work. For me, that's about 10 minutes worth of work. I do that, I export an Excel spreadsheet and send it to him. Congratulations, there you go. Have some data. On a good day, he can even run the report himself. That's not always guaranteed marketing. Um, the other good thing is the end users don't need to know the structure of the database. They don't. There's an application. It provides them a UI. They don't need to know the fact that the country dropdown comes from a different table and the account type comes from another table. <coughs> they have a form and it shows country and account type. It works. It provides data independence. Remember, hark back to about 45 minutes ago when I was talking about if you needed to add an email address to a customer file, you had to update every application because each application modified the underlying data structure. With the database, you can change the structure of the database and not change the application. Well, I'm simplifying. But if you're adding new fields and you haven't rolled out those features yet, the, app, the database could still run while seeing those new fields. It doesn't need to see these new fields because it doesn't know about them. The data in there is still safe, it's still good, it'll still run, but it's still there. So you can change the database structure and the applications don't need to know anything about it. There's other tricks you can do to actually drastically change the database structure and the application doesn't need to know about the changes because you can fake it using a database system. You can rename things on the fly so that you decided that email address should have, should instead be called email address, it should just be email. And you decide to rename that field in the database, which is really dumb to do that, but you can. And then in the application, you can just change how it's accessed so that it still sees it as email address. There's things you can do. Okay, however, as good as the database processing is, as much as I extol its virtues, there's some challenges. Files are bigger. So even if you're storing stuff in the database, it still has to go somewhere on a disk. So that means there's files that contain that data, it's just now it's a special file. Instead of being, I don't know, so you got your stack of magic cards. Right? And you've got a box. And it's a shoe box. That's eh, about that big, right? And you just throw all your cards in there. And you don't care how they're organized. That's a file system. On the other hand, you have a binder with the little dividers, this little slot holders for each of your cards, and you've got dividers in there to say, you know, this is a territory card, this is a whatever card, this is something else card. I don't know anything about magic. I'm just throwing things out there. But I think that was pretty good, though. But you've got all your cards organized. The binder occupies more room than the box, right? But it's organized. That means if you're organizing the data, the information that keeps the data organized has to go somewhere. Therefore, the files are bigger. And they can get a lot bigger, depending on what you do with them. But that being said, the database, the data is bigger, the database is bigger, but it's organized. Complexity goes up. I know it sounds kind of funny saying that, but the complexity does go up. The database structure is more complex. Instead of having one file that has all the customer information, you might have three tables. I'm using terminology I haven't taught yet. But you could have three tables that breaks down the customer information to smaller pieces so that you can reduce the anomalies. It's more complex. Now, here's the biggie for database servers. When the data is shared and a failure occurs, lots of people get impacted. With the old file system ones, you know, if one of the applications stopped working, shipping, for example, you couldn't send product out the door, we could still take orders. With if the central database server shits the bed, nobody's doing nothing that day. You're done. And of course, recovery can be more complicated. When you use the old file system with the application and it blew up, you just restore from a tape backup. Bang, so you lost three hours worth of data, congratulations, we're operational. 
You know, just pay some monkey to type in three hours worth of stuff. That's what high school kids are for. Or level one database students. They're good for that too. If databases can be updated by many users at the same time, now the problem is if it blows up halfway through something, how do you know where you got to recover it from? So the database restore becomes much more complex and difficult. I'm almost done, and then we all get to run away. Database management systems. It's a collection of programs that manage the database structure and controls access to the database. So here's terminology number one. For those of you who have done a lab, you've installed PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL is a database server. It has a database in the background, and then there's a server component that runs that allows you to access this data. It's a database management system. It manages the sharing of data across multiple applications and users. So the server sits there, the applications talk to the server, the server takes care of translating your request to the data. So you ask the server, give me all the customers, it knows where it needs to go get the data, and it gives you the customer information. It's a bit like a librarian. When's the last time one of you went to a library and tried to find a book and couldn't find anything? Happens lots. And then you go and you ask the librarian, I'm trying to find books about uh, nocturnal lemurs. Ah, oh, it's on shelf 12 and back there because they know where it is. She's a database management system because some unknown reason she's memorized every cryptic book in the library. It guarantees that the data is more consistent. The database management system enforces the rules. The data itself is just stuff sitting on a disk. The database management system makes sure that the data is consistent and follows how it goes. It gives you the ability to do ad hoc querying, which is, you know, another diagram. So what happens is the application requests from the database management system, it negotiates with the data, it builds it back and gives it back to the end users. That's what it does. Okay, I'm going to try to fly through these last couple of ones because we got 10 minutes left. <laughs> Importance of database management system. For top management, it provides information necessary to make decisions. In other words, they can decide if they need to lay off half the company because suddenly they realize they didn't sell anything for the last three months. They can access data internally and externally for the upper management, depending on what kind of data they need to have access to. <clears throat> they can make decisions on the performance of the company. For middle management, they can make tactical decisions as in they realized that this cashier makes more mistakes than any other cashier. Maybe they need to get rid of this cashier. Out of here. Um, for operational management, it provides timely information. In other words, at McDonald's by noon, they know how many egg McMuffins they sold. Therefore, if they realize that they're running short on uh, English muffins and that they need to get a new load for tomorrow so they can place an order right away for more English muffins so they can make more egg McMuffins the next day. And for other users, such as the cashiers, can I issue a refund? Is this receipt real? That's you know the lowest level of the access, transactional access. Oh, the guy bought these shoes and now he discovered they don't fit right. Therefore, I'm going to give him his money back. That's kind of stuff. And therefore, it allows you to reduce results within a specified performance level. Uh, that also means um, how fast can we retrieve data to let the cashiers do their job, that kind of stuff. Um, I've got three more slides. And I think I'm going to skip them for today. Yes, I am. Because I'm going to talk about this in detail later. Okay. Before you all run away. And people are running already because I said okay. Next time I won't say okay. Okay. When you get your book, 
I've abbreviated RDDI. That's the that's the beige book. Relative database design and implementation. I'm asking you guys to try. If you have a chance to buy the book and you get it fast, that's the one. Here, give that to me for a second. This book. Okay, this is the biggest reading assignment you're going to get all term because this one's horrifyingly long. Chapters three and four. Try to get it done by next week. That's the only homework you have. I'm asking you guys to read. It's hard, I know. But read, eh? The hybrids, you do them whenever. <laughs> if you want to, go ahead. Lab one, if you've already installed, you're done. That's in class.